As Don mentioned, uh, of course, we're all aware, this is the week of Thanksgiving, and so I have a themed message today about Thanksgiving. I like doing this. Now, some preachers don't. Some get a little almost annoying about it. Uh, say on any given holiday, Mother's Day is one that often they'll say, you know, Mother's Day was created so that Hallmark could make a lot of money off you. I'm not going to preach about that. I'm going to stick with the Word of God. Well, good. Except we're all doing this stuff once we leave church. We know on Mother's Day we're going to go take mom out to a restaurant or barbecue for her or something. We know we're all going to practice Thanksgiving this week. On Christmas week, we're all going to practice Christmas. So I think it's entirely legitimate, in fact, advisable to take our culture and capture it for Christ. And so we're going to talk about Thanksgiving and according to the Word of God, especially Thanksgiving. What a biblical concept, being thankful to the Lord. So we normally preach out of Proverbs, which is good, because today we're also going to be in Proverbs. We're going to start there anyway. So Proverbs chapter 20 is where you want to have your Bibles. But we're just going to read a couple verses out of that, uh, that chapter, and they're going to ask a couple questions. They're going to ask a couple rhetorical questions. Rhetorical questions, what are those? Those are questions where the answer is so obvious, we don't even have to answer it, although we're going to try. So we, we use this a lot in our lives. I'll be going through conversation, and I end with what? You know what I mean? I don't expect an answer. Well, just a minute. I think I know what you mean, Mark. And even when they ask a question, a rhetorical question, I can answer with another rhetorical question. You know what I mean? And someone would say, right? So it's a, it's a grammatical device that we use. And Solomon uses it quite a bit in the book of Proverbs to teach something. So there's going to be an obvious answer to this. So as we look at the goodness of God and what to be thankful for, we want to start with a couple questions in Proverbs chapter 20. Uh, you can read off the screen, and, or you can open your Bibles. I'm going to be reading verse 9, and then we're going to look at verse 24 elsewhere in the chapter. And let's see if we can't uh, come up with good answers to these questions. Starting at Romans 9, or excuse me, why did I say that? Because Cindy's not here. Starting at Proverbs 20, verse 9. Well, if you guys can listen and pray at the same time, if you're gifted that way, you do it. Okay. 29, 20, comma 9. Who can say, I've cleansed my heart, I am pure from my sin? That's a question. And the obvious answer is, uh, duh, nobody. Okay. So we can answer that. I jump over to verse 24, and we've got another question here. It starts with a, a phrase that sets up the question. Man's steps are ordained by the Lord. How then can man understand his way? He can't. But we're going to find out the real answer is only by faith. Lord, as we come today and look into your word, we place the importance of the written word of God, your very text, into our presence today. So take and shape us by your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. So these are kind of some big questions, really. As we go through life, we face questions. We come to holidays like Thanksgiving that are supposed to give us a check in our time where we force ourselves to what? Say, well, what are you thankful for? And we almost get irritated sometimes with, yeah, I know I need to stop and be grateful, and I am, and everything, but... And so when I'm really pushed, I'll say, well, I'm thankful for the big things. I'm thankful for the freedoms in my country. I'm thankful for my family. I'm thankful for my church. And we list those real readily. But we come to this point, how can someone be clean from sin that doesn't sound like a Thanksgiving question, except ultimately, that's, that's the only thing we're really thankful for. Everything else is just gravy on the potatoes, right? How can you cleanse your ways? Only through God. How can I know my way? Only through God. Only by, the, by grace. So 
This first question is about the big one. How do we deal with sin? Sin comes at us on three fronts, by the way. It comes at us in our own sin. That's often how we address it. We want you to hear the gospel. We want you to hear the salvation message that Jesus died for you. He rose from the dead on your behalf, promising new life. So sin is my problem. The second front is we've all been sinned against. And that ain't right. So not only did we commit sin, but we've had sin committed against us. And God fixes that too. He makes it so nobody gets away with it. They're, we can forgive. Victims are not defined by their victimhood. The third front is, I'm not a victim or I didn't commit it. I just see it out there and it bothers me a lot. Jesus died for the sins of the world. That cleansing is going to cover all three of those here. So dealing with sin is going to be a huge part of our Thanksgiving perspective. Can I deal with this? Can I fix this myself? Let me go back to the question. Who can say I've cleansed my heart? I am pure from my sin. Can I fix the sin problem myself? We can try. It's, maybe, maybe I can't do it, but maybe a good person could. Can anyone fix the sin problem? Maybe if you attend the right church or you were, you're born in the right era, you know, you, you do the right things. Can anyone fix their own sin problem? The truth is we can't even get close. We can't even get close. We, we've used many object lessons like throwing a tennis ball to Mars or, or leaping across, you know, no matter how good a broad jumper you are, can you, can you leap to Japan? No, you can't do it. Not only are you not good enough, you can't even get close. And so the answer is the gospel. Now, gospel is one of those church words or Bible words that we think we know what it is, and, and maybe we've even understood a definition. But it's always bigger than we think. Gospel means good news. Okay? And that's what we have. We have good news. You can have your sin problem fixed. Sin leads to death, not just physical death, but spiritual death that lasts forever. But you can have it fixed. That's the good news. However, like a lot of good news, when there's a remedy involved, there's the bad news of understanding the problem that has to be fixed. So it's kind of a blunt truth to understand the gospel here. Number one, I have violated God's law and I stand condemned. When did I do that? Bad news, you're born condemned. But that's not fair. That's what God said, right? So he made a way. Well, I'm going to try to do enough good to overcome my bad. Does that sound reasonable? It kind of sounds reasonable. Except the more good you do, you're adding to the, the bad. According to the scriptures, every good you do is offensive to God because it becomes a manipulation. Yeah. And so when I do something that seems like it's good, it adds to my bad. Well, what if, I, what if I make big contributions to a lot of charities? Yeah, you're doing it to manipulate God, and he said, don't do that. And so now you're adding to your bad by trying to do good. How do I get off this carousel? You can't. You have to be taken off by God. So here's how we can be cleansed. We can't do it by ourselves. All we can do is just admit, I can't do it. I can't do it. Just confess, I'm a sinner. Well, what about the good things I've done? Yeah, they're a problem. I just have to trust that, even if I don't know the details yet, I just have to trust that Jesus can fix it. So I'm just going to believe him. I'm just going to believe he's got it. How can somebody cleanse their ways? I don't know, but Jesus does, and I'm just banking on that. That's the gospel. He doesn't show you that because you've been good. He doesn't show you that because you're handsome. He doesn't show you that because you got good grades in school. He simply is loving and kind. And so he shows you that. So we have a follow-up question here. How do I cleanse my way? Who can be clean? Nobody. 
well, how do I understand all this? I mean, if God's in charge of everything, it says right here, man's steps are ordained by the Lord. Okay, so everything God brings, we understand he's sovereign, he's in control of stuff. How can I understand the way I'm supposed to go? If God is over all this, and he's even over my salvation, how do I know which way to go? How do I figure out the way, the way I should go? How do I go forward in my life? What's my life going to be about? And this is where I want to say it's only by faith. I don't get faith here, but I'm going to go elsewhere in Scripture, and I'm going to prove how do we know the way? By faith. I want to demonstrate this by a very good Thanksgiving passage found in Luke. So turn to the Gospel of Luke. And we're going to be in chapter 17. This is probably a, a well-known story. Um, it's, if you have the Sunday school papers for the kids, you already know the story. We're going to start in verse 11. And if you have the, in your Bible the little header there, it says, Ten lepers cleansed. Okay. So let me read verses 11 through 19 of chapter 17. And, and try to understand what's going on in, in real life. Picture being there, okay? While he, that's Jesus, that's capital H on he. While he was on his way to Jerusalem, he was passing between Samaria and Galilee. These are two small provinces in that area. It'd be like saying he was going from Ferry County to Stevens County, you yeah. know didn't have a long way to go, and yet he was going by foot. Verse 12, as he entered a village, ten leprous men who stood at a distance met him. And they raised their voices, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they were going, they were cleansed. Now one of them, when he saw that he had been healed, turned back glorifying God with a loud voice. And he fell on his face at his feet, giving thanks to him. And he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus answered and said, Were there not ten cleansed? But the nine, where are they? Was no one found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Stand up and go. Your faith has made you well. Let's just picture this scenario a little bit here. This is after Jesus has healed Lazarus, raised him from the dead, but before he's at the banquet that we were looking at last week, before Mary poured perfume on his feet, things got a little hot for him and his disciples, the Sanhedrin one to arrest him. So after Lazarus is raised from the dead, he goes back into the region of Galilee. He's now headed back to Jerusalem, and he's going to be headed to the cross. And as he's crossing into this village, here's a group of 10 guys, and they have leprosy. Well, it's been debated a lot exactly what the Bible means by leprosy. It could be many things, but we're going to take it for what it is. Real leprosy, what's known as Hansen's disease, where there's tissue damage and the nervous system starts failing, and it gets to be a pretty gruesome disease. In that culture, you were required to live outside the city in a, your own little leper colony, and you were to social distance extremely. So these 10 men that normally would not have talked, some were Jewish, some were Samaritan, or at least one was Samaritan, banded together, and they lived out in the open. And they would survive by people maybe compassionately bringing food and then leaving, and then they would go to the food supply because we didn't interact and in case they were contagious, they were to stand off and shout a long distance away. Unclean, unclean, stay away. I'm a leper. What kind of joy do you have in life when that's your job, right? It's not that these men are shouting. They shout all the time. Anybody comes by the road or near, they don't want to get too far from the city because that's how their food is delivered. But they still have to warn everybody. So... You hear shouting as you approach this village. Every time somebody gets closer, they have to give a verbal warning. Except as Jesus approaches, they change what they say. Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Oh, they can't fix their problem. They can't be cleansed by themselves. They can try, right? 
Maybe if they do enough healthy things, their leprosy will go away. Let's treat it like we do our sin problem. Uh, I'm going to brush my teeth extra, and maybe that will kind of balance out my leprosy problem. It doesn't work, right? Well, I've got this really good skincare cream, and, and I, I can't feel my fingers, but I'm putting that on. No, it doesn't help. There's nothing you can do. I'm, I'm eating totally vegan now, so that should help, right? I'm even eating my broccoli. No. All that can help is God's mercy here. So the first thing they have to do, and they cry out for mercy, is they have to recognize their need for healing. Well, it's obvious, isn't it? They know they need healing. They can't feel the ground through their feet. They've lost all feeling in their extremities. They would probably walk around like a one-year-old learning his feet. They, they couldn't feel the ground, right? And they're paying very close attention to anything that could injure them. Because if they hurt themselves, they can't feel it, and you can do some severe damage through infection. So they're being very careful. They're probably also very self-conscious about the damages that have happened already. Jesus, have mercy on us. And Jesus respects our social distancing, doesn't he? Go show yourself to the priest. Well, that wasn't helpful. In that culture, that was who said you were contagious or not. You would go to the priest, and he would tell you whether you needed to isolate. And if you thought you got over this for some reason, he's the one that could declare you clean. So they haven't been cleansed yet. They just make a request for healing. They know they need healing cleansing. They need to be clean. They ask to be clean by asking for mercy. And then Jesus just says, go. Go all the way into Jerusalem. Check with the priest. You could almost take from this, I don't want to deal with you. You go to the priest. He's actually the one that's in charge. So you go to the proper agency and let them take care of you. Except they did one thing. They obeyed. And as they began walking, and you can just picture 10 grown men trying to walk carefully, they begin to feel the ground in the bottom of their feet. They begin to get sensation. They can feel the blood flowing through their fingers. And now they are looking at their skin. And their steps are getting quicker and quicker. They're getting healed. And as they went, they were cleansed, it says. And they got to be excited. They're probably running for the first time in years. They're not walking like toddlers. They're on the move. They're probably all excited. They're all happy. But one, in his joy, turns around and responds to the healer. We have to recognize our need for healing. We have to meet with the healer. And we have to respond to what the healer says. And because he does, he's changed forever. So Jesus welcomes him, and of course, we know how it goes. He says, weren't there 10 of you guys, and there's nine that didn't come back? The nine aren't bad guys. They just didn't respond to Jesus the way this guy did. But Jesus says something profound. He says, your faith has made you well. That was the merciful thing Jesus did. He even gave this man faith. Now, go. Stand up and go. And that's an important word, that go. It is literally get back on the path. You have, a plan. you have a journey that you're on. God is a plan for you. He's mapped out your life. It's time for you to get up. You've been cleansed. Now go. How can someone know the way? Only by faith. Only when you've met Jesus and he's revealed this to you. So i got seven steps in this cleansing that very much match our seven steps as we find Jesus as our Savior. The first is the need. We have to recognize our need. The Bible says in 1 John that if you say you don't have a sin problem, you're just lying to yourself. I have to understand the need. In this case, it was leprosy. In our case, it's a sinful life. Then we have to have a request. Lord, have mercy. I can't do a thing. You have to fix it all. I'm nothing more than a sinner. 
Jesus never says, what do you bring to the table? Well, I got a pretty fat bank account. I can bring that. Okay, bring that along. I'm good with kids. Oh, bring that along. He doesn't ask any of those things. We say, I got nothing. Everything I've got, I'm bankrupt. I have to trust you on everything. There's the need, there's the request, and then here's the command, believe. Trust me. You got it? I got it. Jesus says, I got it. Just trust me. And then there's the obedience. In their case, it was, he said, show yourself to the priest. And by faith, they had to start walking. They had to start teetering off towards Jerusalem. And then... They obeyed. They didn't have to. They could have said, well, anybody can tell us to go see the priest. That's a dumb idea. I thought Jesus would come over here and, and, uh, you know, do all kinds of things. You know, sometimes he uh, would lay hands on people and sometimes he uh, broke up bread and fish and he served people lunch. He didn't do any of that. He just said, get out of here. I'm not going. No, they had to obey and they did. There's a need, there's a request, there's a command from Jesus, the obedience, and as they obeyed, they experienced the healing. And it was life-changing. Wow. But then there's the response. When God has saved you from your sin and forgiven you and you've obeyed, everything changes. Nothing's the same. And like the Samaritan, we need to respond And just say, now, Lord, everything's new. I'm going to follow you no matter what. You've become the center of everything. Before this, I was a leper. I'm not going to get back to my old job. I'm not going to get back to what I was. I'm just following you. And then sending. God sends forth. How can I understand my way? Who can understand his way? God's in charge of everything. You can understand your way. Because God's in charge of everything. Now let's make this a thanksgiving thing. Go back to uh, Psalm 100. We read it together. We had a little bit of a debate today. As I found out that Don was going to read Psalm 100, I said, that's excellent. I'm going to be preaching through Psalm 100 today. He says, well, we're going to read it together. I said, we can throw my version on the screen. Let's read it. But I'm reading out of the New American Standard Bible. And you all read out of the New International Version. Add this little spice to the formula. I memorized this as a kid in King James. So if I read this, and we read this together, and something doesn't sound what's on, it's because I slipped into King James in my head, okay? But it is a Thanksgiving psalm. So let's, I'll reread this. You follow along. And we want to take this apart and really learn why it is good to give thanks to the Lord. Uh, The title before the first verse says, A Psalm for Thanksgiving. Verse 1, Shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful singing. Know that the Lord himself is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name, for the Lord is good. His loving kindness is everlasting and his faithfulness to all generations. For the Lord is good. That says it all right there. That's the starting point for almost everything. God is a good God. Now, we'll recognize our sin and say, I'm not good. Okay, let's go from there. The uh, history of this psalm, it was sung at tabernacles. Tabernacles was basically the Hebrew thanksgiving, okay? During tabernacles or booths, they would get together, and it was like a big camping trip, really, for, for, for the family. Everybody went to Jerusalem, and for a week, you built little camping sites, You can even, to this day, order what they call a sukkah, a little hut. And it was to remind you that when Israel left Egypt and had their time in the wilderness, God took care of them. God looked out for them. He always provided food. He provided a way. He provided water in a very dry desert. And so every year they gathered to be thankful to God 
And they did this by, even if you lived in Jerusalem, you went out and you lived outside or you lived on the roof. And said at a good festival, you could go out and look at the hills around Jerusalem and there was campfires at night. Everybody's having a great time. You started by singing Psalm 93 when you arrived in Jerusalem and you ended and you left and you were sent out. You read Psalm 100. So the history of this is a praise psalm and going forth, always aware that God is good. That's the history of the psalm. Let's look at the message of the psalm. Start again here at the top. Shout joyfully. Shout joyfully with all your heart, okay? That's how we would say this. Shout with all your heart, as loud as you can. When you sang today, by the way, you guys were in great voice this morning. I thought you did excellent. Thoroughly enjoyed it. When we say this, I learned it this way. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Okay? It's a joyful noise. If you can't sing, if you sound like a chainsaw, it's the joyful noise. It's not, it's, but it says, at the top of your lungs, as loud as you can. And some of you don't, and I think some of us are thankful for that, but <laughs> you're not wrong if you sing off key and you sing as loud as you can. That's obeying a command. The idea here, there's noise involved. Shout to the Lord. He's good. All the earth. This isn't just written to the ones going to tabernacles. This isn't just written to the children of Israel. It's written to all of us for all ages, Jew and Gentile. We're all responsible to praise God loudly for all he's done. Most of us were taught what? Shh, you're in church. Be quiet. Okay. You know why I don't mind that sound right there? We love, by the way, young families, we love hearing your kids, okay? Now, we have a kind of a running joke here. If they catch fire, take them out, <laughs> you know. Or if they bleed and make too big of a puddle, take them out. But otherwise, we don't care about noise. We love the sounds of family. We love the sounds of God's goodness. And one of the greatest goodnesses we have is children. So part of Thanksgiving, a big part, is the noise, as we were having our prayer time this morning, we're in the other room and there's music being played and then you all are coming in and we're in at prayer time and, and you're talking loudly and we could have come out and gone, shh, we're praying. No, it's not a library, it's a church. We love noise. All of us. Serve the Lord with gladness. What is gladness? It's laughing. It's rolling on the floor laughing, Okay. Laughter, and if you're going to Tom Moore's service this afternoon, I want you to notice a phenomenon. When a believer passes, it's not a quiet affair. There will be some tears shed, but if you just stop and listen to the atmosphere in a church, you're going to hear laughter. You're going to hear people enjoying the fact that Tom finished his race well, that Tom's not hurting right now. He's not confused. He has nothing to be ashamed of. Death has been conquered. Serve the Lord with gladness. That means there ought to be laughter, there ought to be joking, there ought to be music. It should just be a wonderful time. Are you getting this as a public affair, that this is a noisy affair? Come with joyful singing. The idea of a joyful singing here is with a song stuck in your head. Now, maybe you have control over this. I don't. I hear a song or a piece of a song, and all day long, that's in my head. Hopefully it's a glorious one, right? So even as much as I like the Beatles, if I get, hey, Jude, you know, I got to get a praise song going. Otherwise, I'm going, na, 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 hey, because that goes on forever, right? <laughs> so I get where I'm doing that, and I'm like, you know, shout to the Lord all the, get that song going in my head. I got to, got to prime the pump a little bit. That's okay. Get a song in your Song in your heart, song in your head. Dwell on the goodness of God. The idea here is with joyful singing. We're coming up on Thursday, and that's a good day for us. It's not for, I drove by turkeys on the drive-in, and you know how they are. Right now they're very furtive, right? They're sneaking around. Like, if I could just make it to Thursday, I think we're all safe, you know. 
And so they're, they're slinking behind trees. And I'm like, you idiots. We'll just come out Friday and get you, you know? <laughs> but it's a good day for us, and it's, it's a prosperous day. And we're all thinking about the goodness of God because I come to that phrase there, that one word in verse 3, no. No for certain. In fact, this is no experientially. How, does, how do little ones know that mom and dad love them? Because mom and dad hold them. Mom and dad sing to them. Mom and dad are tender to them. They don't read the directions, you know. Dear baby, welcome to earth. Mom and dad love you. Well, okay. It's good to know. No, they have to experience it. When you know that the Lord himself is God, you know that because you've experienced him. And it's a certain, certain thing. Because we're his people. This is beyond Israel, as we said. It's all the peoples of the earth. So we have the history of the psalm, tabernacles. We know the message of the psalm. Be noisy, be happy, enjoy it to the full. This is why we feast, by the way. God's love is more than you can hold. God's goodness overflows. It's an overflowing cup. God never says, okay, I'm going to give you, you finish your love. I've got a little bit of love for you here. And when you finish that, we'll, you know, clean your plate. And we'll give you a little bit more. No, he pours it out on you. Everything about God is lavish. Everything from God's blessings is extravagant. So you're not eating because you just love pumpkin pie or I'm going to have more cranberries on that. You're doing it because God's goodness is more than you can hold. And for one day, try. So that's how we do it, don't we? We have lunch and, or dinner or whenever we eat, and then we're like, oh, I shouldn't have done that. You didn't have pie? I got to wait on the pie. Pretty soon, you're just coming off of extra full. What kind of pie do we have, by the way? I mean, I'm going to have pumpkin. Everybody's going to have pumpkin, but there's apple, right? And pecan? Oh, I can eat a little slice of each. And put the whipped cream on the top. You know? Because God's good, and that's what we're celebrating. But now there's commands here. I mean, it sounded like commands there, but it's more of an encouragement. We come right down to these commands the command for public praise in verse 4. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Thanksgiving and praise, I'd like to point this out. Thanksgiving is what we dress right to God. So it's entirely appropriate, whether you do this before others or in your own heart, to address God in person, face to face as it was, and say, Lord, I thank you. The goodness I have is from you. My cleansing is from you. The knowledge of the way before me now is because you intervened in my life. You need to talk to God directly and give thanks. Praise is more like we probably do around here. Well, I'm thankful to God for, and I'm telling you what God has done. That's praise. So think of thanksgiving as vertical, praise as horizontal. All of it's appropriate. Because the Lord is good. And all the time, God's good. Yes, that's, in fact, that's the central message of the Bible. That's where it all starts. God is perfect God. And he's not perfect and aloof. He wants to share his goodness with us. Oh, in fact, it never quits. For his love is everlasting. Or his loving kindness or his mercy. Jesus, Master, have mercy. Yes, and it's going to never stop and his faithfulness to all generations. Once again, think of it as what's behind me, what's before me, what's to the right, what's to the left, what's above and what's below. God's goodness is in every direction. Now let's ask a hard question. What about the stuff I'm experiencing that doesn't seem like goodness right now? Sometimes that makes the holidays hollow. God knows the way. Let's start with being cleansed. That's the first and most important thing. After that, we can trust God for everything. We can trust him for everything. You know, Abraham thought the promise was over. God said, go sacrifice Isaac. And he obeyed and God intervened. He said, the, I'm giving the land to you, Jacob. And then Jacob had to move to Egypt. And he says, Jacob, I got this. And he intervened. 
Whatever's coming your way that seems not good, not the promise, not God's being the way, God knows everything, and his sovereignty then becomes an incredible blessing. So as you thank him, you even thank him for the stuff you don't understand yet, because he's never let us down. This man ran on his way, and he, for the first time, got to see his wife again, hold his kids. He ran to the priest, and he was declared clean. It doesn't tell us the rest of his story, but we can imagine how good it was He celebrated with gladness and with joy. So not just on Thursday, but from now on, we want to be thankful that our life doesn't rest on our goodness. My goodness is very situational. My goodness depends upon what I'm going through now. And it's tainted. And I end up weighing my good and my bad on scales, and it never really works out. But if I base this on God's goodness, it's abundant, and it never ends. His loving kindness is everlasting and his faithfulness to all generations. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you this morning for your wonderful, abundant goodness. And I pray that we would enter into this season being very aware that you provide a way of cleansing, that we can just cry out mercy. There's nothing we can do to fix our situation, but you fix everything. So, Lord, we want to shout with joy. We want to sing at the top of our lungs. We want to both thank and praise. And, Lord, I I want to have compassion and understanding for those who seem like they have a great big hurdle right now that gets in the way of this. But let them see that you overcome these things. So, Lord, we enter this season with great gratitude in our hearts, for you are good. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.